Hello and welcome to Sitsayas 21. Today I'm joining you from the unceded lands of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. My name's Alice Motion and I'm going to be chairing this session. I'd like to thank our platinum sponsor, Atlas of Living Australia, for sponsoring this session. Thank all of those folks. Um, today we're going to hear from Corey Tutt and I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce Corey. Um, if you have any questions for him, you can place them in the Q&A function and I'll try and come back to them at the end of his talk. Um, and now I'd like to tell you a little bit about Corey. Uh, for those of you who haven't um, seen him yet, I don't know how you could have missed him. Um, you should be following him on all your socials, but here we go. Corey Tutt is a proud Camilleroy man and a Young Australian of the Year for New South Wales in 2020. He's the CEO and founder of the charity Deadly Science, which provides science resources, mentoring and training to over 110, 110 remote and regional schools across Australia, with a particular focus on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. The schools involved with Deadly Science have reported a 25% increase in engagement with STEM and increased attendance. As a member of the Science Technology Australia Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee, Corey is also contributing to the development of their first Reconciliation Action Plan to further engage participation and inclusion of First Nation peoples in STEM. Corey has recently authored three books. That's not one, not two, but three books. One of them called The First, of first Scientists is already out and it's sold out in some of the, the biggest and best known bookstores in Australia. Um, so try and get your orders in while you can. A wonderful present for uh, the children in your life or for the young at heart. It's a children's book for kids to discover how Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have practiced all forms of not just STEM, but STEAM throughout history and present. In addition to this book, Corey has developed a STEAM series with Australian Geographic, with animal ad adaptations and wild weather released in August. Corey also writes for K-Zone magazine and has a section here for the Deadly Scientists. So you can see Corey is a pretty busy person, so we're absolutely thrilled to welcome him today. Um, Corey, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for addressing us. Thank you, my deadly friend, Alice Motion. And um, it's an absolute honor to be joining you all today. Um, first of all, I'm going to say Yama, which is hello in my language. Um, but I also want to pay respects to the Dungadi and the Biripai people. I'm currently on the mid-north coast of New South Wales, and I want to pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Um, well, what is this thing called deadly science? Well, don't worry, you're not going to die. This is no conspiracy. Deadly in our world is cool or awesome. So try and think about it as awesome science or cool science. Um, I'm going to quickly share my slide. So Deadly Science is a charity organization that I founded. Um, we just got DGR status. Woohoo! So um, if you donate to us, it's tax deductible. But um, what we do is we provide STEM resources to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, mentoring as well. Um, and I'm going to tell you a bit about that. Um, so again, deadly, you're not going to die. It's just a bit of slang. So think about it as cool science. Um, let's, first of all, we need a bit of a history lesson. So we need to jump in the DeLorean. Um, and this is all the Aboriginal clans across Australia and all the Aboriginal people that, um, that live in, in Australia and inhabit Australia, all the mobs. Um, as you can see, there's many different countries, many different cultures. For example, um, my people, the Camilleroy people, um, we vary. Our language varies from wherever you come from in that nation. It's not all, not all Aboriginal people are the same that come from that one nation. Actually, the science varies. Um, so it's really, really important today you put in your chat, um, your chat and you ask you, when you ask a question, put whose land you're on. Um, it's a really good exercise to acknowledge your first people and the first people that inhabited this land um, before life as we knew it um, today. So um, I encourage you all to put whose land you're on. Again, a bit about me. I'm a Camilleroy man. My family come from Walgett in northern New South Wales, and I'm very, very, pr I'm very, very proud. I'm not so proud of this stat. I'm 29 years old, so I'm getting closer to 30. And I've worked at the University of Sydney for the last, previous five years, but I've also been the CEO of Deadly Science. And as Alice um, kindly alluded to, I am an author as well. Um, my passion is animals and people. 
Um, I started off as a young kid. I went through a lot of trauma as a child. Um, and my sort of solace, my sort of escape was going to the backyard and picking up lizards and snakes. And we all know a kid like that, especially in Australia. Um, but I kind of never grew out of it. And I wanted to become a zookeeper. But being an Aboriginal man, coming from a low socioeconomic area, I had was raised by my single, uh, single mum and my older sister. I was told that you know, I couldn't be a zookeeper because to be a zookeeper, you need a double degree in zoology. Um, and this careers advisor sort of said, stick to a trade or you'll probably end up in jail or worse. Um, and those words kind of stuck with me. I was always um, very determined as a young person. I remember once I was told on the football team that I was part of that I was too small to play footy. So I literally tackled everyone on my team and the other team just to make the team I was trying out for. So this was this has always been ingrained in my dna and you know and it, and it comes from my my ancestry my my pop my family that have survived for thousands of years um and hundreds of years with all the things that have happened um and i think that's where my determination comes from so i i proved this career advisor wrong i left school at 16 and i went to a place called boy uprook which is a total of 3,885 kilometers from my house um, at 16 and I ended up becoming a zookeeper and I worked at Shawhaven Zoo for a bit. Um, then I became an alpaca shearer and then I started working at the University of Sydney and I started this thing called Deadly Science, um, which was really interesting because it was founded in Waterloo and Redfern and up at the castle building at UCIT as well. And I was just yarning with other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids. And if I can say I was a kid at the time, I was probably about 25. Um, and we were talking about the stars, we were talking about science and, and these kids were just so um, interested. And, you know, it came apparent to me that, you know, a lot of these kids don't get the opportunity to do STEM or science and they're often not told they can do it or it's not, we often push Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids towards sport and art. And again, this is an example. When I was a child, the only recognition I got or encouragement I got was when I was scoring tries on the footy field. Now, Things change and deadly science kind of grew and I can tell you why it grew, but here's a little bit more about me. My growth I've had in my life, my 21 years on this planet is I've taught 50 kids how to read, just like I'm talking to you on Zoom. That's a lifetime of skills. When you can read and you can become literate, you can learn and that is education and that equals freedom. But science equals hope. And for me, um, as I've gone on this journey with Professor Motion as well, um, who was there from probably the, she was probably one of the only people apart from Professor Mary Ann Large that actually gave me a chance um, when I was coming up with the idea of deadly science. And so if we get back in the DeLorean and we go back to 2019, I get this really strange email. You've been nominated for Young Australian of the Year. I didn't even know what that meant. But for me, these things became... A responsibility and they are a responsibility as much as they're a fantastic achievement i am determined more than ever to make these awards accessible to young deadly scientists around australia um, and and part of what i do is when i go out to schools i'll bring some of these awards these treasured awards that sit on my shelf covered in dust if i don't you know take them out to schools and and the reason why i take them out to schools i put a bit of gaffer tape over my name put a bit of gaffer tape over corey tut and i ask these kids why do you deserve to be Young Australian of the Year? Why do you deserve to be the Indigenous CSIRO STEM champion? I'm good to my aunties. I pick up rubbish in the playground. I'm kind to others. And this is what makes deadly scientists good, empathetic people. Because when we do science, we're always a hypothesis to make tomorrow's better. So I guess my role has merged now from helping these kids understand science and and see themselves in the picture of science and decolonizing that lab coat that image of that albert einstein that you know thomas edison because a lab coat is not based on gender or race it's just a bit of ppe that stops you from getting chemicals on your skin so why is it that we don't see aboriginal and torres strait islander kids in science well are we pre-programmed to think that they only like sport and art well yes so it's so important when we have these awards and we have these acknowledgements that we share it with the next generation so that that can be possible for them. 
Um, I started Deadly Science after finding a school in the NT, the Northern Territory, that was just so grossly under-resourced for STEM. This school had 15 books in its whole school. Four of them were dictionaries because there was a there was a belief that, you know, that there was, you know, this school was resourced enough, but it wasn't. Actually, the first book I ever read was Reptiles and Colour by Harold Cogger, and it was printed in 1984. And by the time it got to me, it was 1998. Um, but I treasured, treasured this book because my pop made me read it to him because he was illiterate and he taught me how to read that way. So I, if you, you know, you go to bookshops too much when you can quite clearly drop a thousand dollars at a bookshop. Um, and that's what I did the first time I sent books and then it sort of progressed and I started getting donations from the physics building at the university of Sydney and from random, random people as well. And, and professor Mary and large as well. Um, donated a lot of books to Deadly Science and I was going to this post office every single week, sometimes multiple times in a week. And you know you go to a post office too often when they're reminding you of your anniversary, your birthday, and also I broke my foot going to the post office because I was playing rugby, which I do in my spare time, and my foot just crumbled. But I was also working two jobs. I was working at Duffy's Forest um, at, at the pet hotel and I was working at the University of Sydney as an animal technician doing extra hours um, to pay for these books. But it was actually a friend of mine that said, why don't you start a GoFundMe? People would want to donate to this. And then I started putting online, it sort of exploded. But to date, we've sent over 20,000 resources to remote schools across Australia. And it's pretty deadly. We do, do Zoom sessions and you can see my face there. This is me from a couple of weeks ago with my lockdown haircut, and my big Afro, um, showing the kids my book. This is me last week with my team and um, Crystal Di Napoli, um, a Camillory astrophysicist, and we do Skype sessions where kids can ask absolutely anything. Um, currently in development, which is running at the moment, um, and feel free to join it, is um, we have a Zoom scientist platform, which we are making lesson plans and um, Zooms possible for these kids. So right up here, we've got Bundjalung Country, which is Cabbage Tree Island, and they're doing a Zoom with yours truly. And Paul Dempsey joined us for the last bit of the um, Zoom, and he's from the rock band Something for Kate. And he was explaining to us the, the science around music and the guitar and the engineering around that. And then down the bottom here, we've got Badu Island Remote Community School in the Torres Strait, the furthest north island in Australia, um, in the Torres Strait. And, you know, the kids just love this. They love yarning with scientists because they don't get to have this every day. Um, and I think that's pretty sad. So we um, we conduct a number of these a week. We've actually got one this week on Friday um, where we're speaking to a paleontologist from the Melbourne uh, Museum and they're talking to our kids in Jill Cominion. And it's pretty deadly. Um, again, we provide high school students and primary school, school students with um, experiments to like to spark interest in STEM. This here is a video we did down in Redfern where we got kids at the zoo and we taught them how to be ecologists. We taught them how to be zookeepers. We gave them all the animal facts, but something peculiar happened. I gave them each a sheet of paper and I said, here's five facts about an echidna. But by the time we came around to um, shoot the video, the kids had a couple of pages. So they went away and they found more facts about the echidnas, a bit more, more facts about the animals. And I thought that was really deadly. Um, this here is my OG school, Robinson River School, and they have riots, literally riots, if um, science isn't done on a Friday. And this school is really special to me because I put a lab in this school. I put a science lab in this school and you'll see a few of their photos throughout this presentation. Now, this school in particular is um, really, really prevalent in um, first scientists. So if you do buy that book, you'll see them in the book, which is a thrill for them. Um, like I said, we've provided 20,000 books and resources and culturally appropriate resources as well. Did you know that Deadly Science put the first ever microscope in Warakunia Remote Community School? Now, I can say that another 50 times um, for remote schools where they haven't had microscopes. And where literacy and numeracy levels are really low um, because, you know, often the kids we're working with, English is their third or fourth language. Um, we have improved, in, we've improved literacy levels and we've improved vocabularies as well. Like if you put a microscope in a school and you teach the kids how to use it, that is an explosion of new words. That is an explosion of, wow, that's awesome. That's deadly. Um, so that's the impact of deadly science. It's been incredible. 
Um, as you can see, we've improved literacy levels, and, and this is a regular occurrence for my desk at the moment. At the moment, if you see that right-hand side, that is my kitchen bench and some letters I got last week. Um, but we often get le letters from our deadly scientists, and, and they include, um, thanks for teaching me that an octopus has eight brains and four hearts or three hearts. Um, and, and these are, you know, this is impact. These kids are really appreciating the science. And, and to, if you had told me in 2018 that kids in remote communities would be writing me letters in 2021, thanking me for teaching them obscure facts about um, mollusks, then I would probably fall off my chair and wouldn't believe you. Um, but this is the impact that deadly science has had on these communities. And it's, it's like, you know, for us, when we see a kid or a person in a deadly science shirt, they're part of us, they're part of the deadly science team. And it's really galvanized everyone and it's pretty deadly. So um, I'm going to start doing some tear jerkers now. This is Trey Williams. Um, Trey Williams is from a place called Penawanaka Community um, in remote WA. It's in near Geraldton. And Trey, um, Andy, his teacher, contacted me early on in 2019 and said, hey, I've got this kid. He's, he's in trouble. He's getting, being kicked off the Clontuff sporting team. He's not doing really well academically. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll have a yarn with him because I'd like to yarn with everyone and I talk too much anyway. So the more people I can talk to, the better. Um, so I started yarning with this kid. He was 14 at the time. And um, he he told me, he confided me, he's like, I don't really know how to read well. And I'm like, well, that's okay. I don't know how to read well. Um, so I spent some time mentoring Trey and now he doesn't want to be a deadly footballer anymore. He wants to be a deadly geologist. Um, and, th and this is right across Australia and right across the country. There's, there's kids like that that we've helped individually and, you know, we're helping them find their passion and purpose. And now you've heard a lot of other speakers today and over the last couple of days, and there's one thing we all have in common and it's not having smashed avocado for breakfast. It's actually passion and purpose. And, and people who have passion generally find their purpose and this is what our role as educators is to help our kids find their passion. Um, we've been helping schools um, and not just schools, but kids in the Juvenile Justice Centre. I actually put a library in Grafton um, Juvenile Correction Centre school. Um, I provided them with brand new science books. Why? Because just because you've made a mistake as a young person does not mean you should be devoid from learning STEM or education. So I'll quite often send books to Dondale and other juvenile corrections facilities because I think that these kids are deadly and I think they need an opportunity to love science and if you've made a mistake then that's okay as long as you own it and you shouldn't be robbed of the opportunity of an education so we work with kids that are not in the schooling system as well often um, you'll see me on Captain Starlight's um, Facebook page and I often do um, Zooms with kids in hospital as well because not every deadly scientist is going to feel well um, or be healthy 100% of the time and sometimes it's just really important to to let these know, let these kids know that they're supported in the good times and also the bad. Um, we've been sending telescopes um, to you know kids all over Australia and this is um young Kate Lean and she's from the MJD Foundation and she's from Groot Island and this was one of the only promises that I've that I haven't been able to keep for one of my deadly scientists. I promised Caitlin a telescope that she could see the stars. Um, I tried to find one that met her abilities and needs. Um, but I think that if we all um, take a second to visualize this, this moment, I couldn't keep my promise, which I hate myself for. But um, the next best thing was getting a projector to project the stars around Caitlin because she said to me, I just want to see the stars. I would love to see stars. And I think that that gives us hope because when we look above, we don't know a lot and it gives us hope for the future. And, um, you know, young Caitlin, I decided to give her a projector to and my deadly junior scientist award to because I think she's pretty deadly. And I don't, and again, just because you might not have, you not might not be able body and you have a disability does not mean you shouldn't enjoy STEM or science because it really is for everyone. Um, we engage our kids in experiences that, you know, and, and, and STEM experiences that previously would have been out of reach for remote communities. Um, you can see my friend down the bottom here, Mr. Dan Sultan, and he's playing a song about a farting gorilla and he's including science lyrics in it, which is pretty deadly. Um, and we're doing STEM experiments here in Robinson River School 
Um, and again, this is the old rain, the and Redfern Drum School as well down in Redfern. Um, and we provide these experiments and these kits because it's so important to get these kids practical skills. Now, I guarantee you, um, my deadly scientists are so fast at learning how a microscope works that they would probably be at the top in any sort of exam for using a microscope um, with any other student in Australia because they love it and they go bananas. Um, we also provide drink bottles. We haven't done this in a while, but we also provide drink bottles. I have a firm belief that every single student in Australia should have access to their own drink bottle, a sustainable drink bottle. The fact that not every student gets access to a drink bottle or a lunchbox or fresh food is a travesty. And I think that we, we as a society need to address our privilege so we can make sure that everyone has access to food and fresh water and their own drink bottle. Again, this has given a newfound energy um, for STEM. You know, these are, um, these are our rangers up at Kirikara and they're tracking the bill before us and they're working with one Professor Kathy Belloff, give her a follow um, on this ARC grant and providing them with bilby samples for genomic testing, which is, um, it's really unique because um, these, these deadly rangers are looking, are they, are, they are supporting the work, but they're also on the forefront of it and they're doing such a deadly job. So big claps to them. Um, we work with other orgs as well. Um, I mentioned Captain Starlight. We also work in the disability space. So we did this program called Deadly Steps with Heart Research Foundation. And I forgot to put in the bylaws that you shouldn't play deadly hockey. Um, you actually have to do the steps. But these kids, um, my my foster care kids that are in um, in Cairns, they ended up beating everyone by an average of 50,000 steps. So they won themselves a telescope, which is pretty deadly. So we also send out emotional cards to um, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids with a disability because if we can't do your it, which is do your own research, and we can't communicate it, and they can't communicate to us, then we're not we're not doing science. We're not doing science engagement. And I'd like you all when we talk about outreach, I want you guys to delete the word outreach from your vocabulary because outreach says that we've got all the knowledge and we're we're putting it down to these people that are below us but actually this is engagement and it's a collaboration it's a collaboration between young people and deadly science so let's just call it engagement let's call it what it is um outreach is it's not outreach so i think we should change our words around that um again this is the jalaba the great desert skin and also you'll see here a little plumber's camera, which is orange, and that is photographing a night parrot. So this is part of our ARC grant as well. We're supporting rangers and then they're supporting our kids. They're taking them out on country. They're using the equipment. They're using the resources and they're helping protect species as well. So deadly science is actually, um, you know, we're actually participating in science projects now um, across Australia. And, and this is really deadly. I think that this is the future. Um, and, and if you are working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, make sure you use the traditional names and make sure you put them down as authors and acknowledge the first scientists, the first people of this country properly. Um, what's next? Drum roll, please. I'm hearing the drum rolls. Um, we're actually turning um, STEM resources through Primary Connections into a program called Our World, Our STEM. So I have this really unique idea where I want to translate the STEM resources that I'm sending into first languages to revive first languages. So it's really deadly that everyone gets involved and they donate to deadly science because we really, really want to be able to translate um, STEM resources from English into language so we can revive first languages and we can continue to um, encourage these deadly scientists to find their passion and purpose. How you can help? Oh my God, I thought you would never ask. Oh, um, you can donate to Deadly Science. You can start a book drive. You can volunteer your time. Help us build. Become a cog in the, the chain for us to help us expand. I'm no longer a one-man band. I need help. We've got staff. We need help. We need to build partnerships, um, sustainable partnerships that last years. We're here for a long time, not just a good time. So come with us. Come on the run. Buy a shirt. Sponsor a Deadly Scientist Award. If you can't do any of that, then that's cool. Share our story, share our journey and stay deadly.
Thank you so, so much, Corey. Um, it's always strange on a virtual platform, but I can hear people clapping in their living rooms and on their in their gardens and in their um, homes around Australia. That was fantastic talk as always, and it's lovely to hear you speak. Um, we have a few questions in the chat, and I'd like to encourage people to continue to pop those questions in the chat because Corey... Um, uh, as he said, he, he loves to speak with people and he'd love to know what you would like to know and um, to start that conversation. I have one question to start off with, Corey, from Lisa. Um, oh, hello, Lisa. Um, and Lisa particularly would really like to know, you know, we're a community of people who work in citizen science. What would you like us to do um, to, to better um, include... So for the citizen science community to better include Indigenous communities and children? Well, one, you got to make it practical and you got to make it um, useful as well. Every every project needs to have a, you know, have a, you know, a, a practical solution to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. Plus also don't call it outreach. Um, you're going to turn people off in the community if you call it outreach because outreach to us has a negative um connotation it's like I hold all the mighty knowledge and I'm going to pass it down to you who's below me but actually this is engagement because when you engage in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities you actually learn probably more than they do and it's actually a learning experience so it's a collaboration um, just like you would collaborate with another lab you wouldn't call it outreach so let's just call it engagement what it is and I think that when you want to engage with Indigenous communities um it's got to have practical solutions for them. So, for example, um, Kathy Belloff's lab and Deadly Science, we are working with the Kirikara Rangers because the practical solution is saving the bilby and the Jalabar and caring for country and it's working together and it's collaborative. Um, so there's plenty of ways you can do that. Thanks, Corey. Um, so um, I think there's probably a lot of people who are listening who are working in citizen science and would love to work with um uh, with deadly science or work with Aboriginal communities. And I think um, one of the things you've mentioned is, you know, really important to start that partnership early and to understand what the people you're working with want to find out, which is um, key to a lot of citizen science practice too. Um, do you have any suggestions for how people could reach out to you or to other communities in a way that's culturally respectful? So there's two ways we can um, engage. Um, Deadly Science, shoot us an email. We are really short because we don't have a lot of time because we, we only, there's only four of us in the team now that are paid and um, we're still building things at the moment. We're still building all our governance and making our making ourselves, you know, um, sustainable for the long term. But the thing is, with, when you work with Indigenous communities, your greatest tool as a citizen scientist is actually on the side of your head, these two things your ears because um conversations when you have conversations you've got to listen to the need and you've got to come out with practical solutions to address that need and i think that you know as as a society we're getting better at acknowledging first nations people and the relationship is getting better even though it's it's a slow you know sort of process but sometimes the best things take time and they also take they also start with the words we probably don't want to hear um you know, and when when we start with the words we don't want to hear, we probably acknowledge that, you know, some terrible things have happened to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But when you acknowledge that, you start to see the good in the culture. And I think that's really important for all Australians is that, you know, we need to acknowledge that some terrible things happened. We need to apologise. We need to make it right. And then we can, we can celebrate that, that we come from the country whose first people invented bread. Yeah, there's much to reflect on to and to to celebrate as well, Corey. Um, and I think the work that you do has showed, you know, just just the impact of of science, um, of collaboration, of listening to to people and to listening to what different schools and different young people might need. Um, if there is something that you know is there anything particular that um in terms of resources for science other than books that you have noticed that schools or communities need that perhaps citizen science projects could be thinking about or thinking about how they might work with you to to supply those resources i'm going to, I'm going to start with a timeless quote that i've used way too much and education equals freedom 
it's the freedom to learn and find your passions and grow. Um, but science equals hope. And it might be the hope of the new COVID vaccine that's going to send us back to normal and potentially send us back to the pub. Um, but, you know, that's the hope of it, right? So what our kids need and what they need with science is a bit of hope because they're the best scientists because they're always asking why. Now, the best thing that we can do with deadly science is um, volunteer your time. Come do a Zoom with me. Um, come Zoom with a school. And I am, I am pretty busy, so if I don't get back to you straight away, it means that I'm working really, really hard on something else, but I will get back to you when I can. Um, but, you know, let's, let's develop things together that, you know, let's talk to the schools. Schools need practical things that, that fill their young people with hope because part of the rule, part of the, I guess part of the thing about education is that it's not teaching your kids as much information as they could possibly fit into their brains, but it's actually helping kids find their passions so that they can find those things out for themselves. Thanks, Corey. Lots of lots for us to think about. I've got a question for you from from Bill now. So Hello, Bill. you're gonna have to you're gonna have to settle into this one, Corey, because it's projecting you. You've been you've told us about the DeLorean going back into your past. This one goes into your future. So Bill, Bill would like to know where would you like to see deadly science by the time you retire? You know, in terms of your legacy, what would you like deadly science to be or to have achieved? Well, firstly, I don't want to be standing in this seat talking to you. I want one of my deadly scientists to be talking to. You. I want them to be, I want the next generation to take over deadly science, um, just like our old people did um, many, many moons ago. But you know, if I jump in my DeLorean, I want to see Deadly Science facilitating scholarships um, for our deadly scientists to go to university um, to get a higher education or if university isn't their thing, get a STEM job. You know, STEM jobs are deadly. Um, you know, you can become an animal technician and learn so much about genetics and learn about um, product management and time management and, and things like that. Um, I want Deadly Science to be at the forefront of that getting our kids into these opportunities. Um, I want to facilitate, you know, I want to see every single remote school in Australia have a STEM lab. How cool would that be? You go out to a remote community and you see a science lab in a remote community and they're doing science, they're doing chemistry, their brains are exploding because of all the, the new words they're learning and also the, the wonder. Um, I want to see this happen. Um, and I think that by the time I retire, I would like to look back and see an organization that is working collaboratively with all Aboriginal communities and non-Indigenous people as well and, you know, a fair and equal um, STEM field. Thanks, Corey. I've got a question. Um, oh, no, it's actually just a, lots of people are writing things and they're not all questions. Good. They're Damon's just good. really, they're really <laughs> excited to, to hear about the work that you're doing and to know about your books and all of your projects. Another shout out, in case you haven't heard, this, um, Corey's also the co-host with Carly Noon of the Cosmic Vertigo podcast. And um, if you haven't heard it yet, you should download it from wherever you get your podcast and have a listen um, because it's fantastic. Um, Corey, I would like to ask you some questions too. And I'm really, I'm really, I don't want to take all of your, I don't want to take all of the questions because I can, I'm fortunate enough to be able to ask you them um, via text or when we catch up. But um, I would like to know, what was the inspiration for your first scientist book? And, you know, what was the process like of uh, suddenly becoming an author of multiple books? Oh, uh, um, so I've been, I've been sort of thinking about a book for a really, really long time. Um, since I probably started sending out books to remote communities, to be honest, um, you know, there was nothing on the market. You know, the only thing that was on the market was dark emu, and that's about agriculture. But I wanted a, a black fella science book um, for young people that, you know, that was easy to read, that people could pick up, and then they could gain an appreciation for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples around Australia. But um, the, the interesting thing is when you open up the book, you'll see um, this acknowledgement to country in, in there. And it actually came from the devastating bushfires that, um, were devastating much of where I was born, the UN country. And um, Alice, you'll remember that Deadly Science provided books to all the kids that were suffering from the bushfires. So the kids that had lost their homes, we replaced their books. Now, I wrote that country, I wrote that acknowledgement of country just because I was just incredibly sad um, seeing the country burn and, and 
my home country as well, which is, you know, I'm, I'm a Camilleroy man, but Ewan is where I was born. Um, so I really wanted to also um, do something that hasn't been done before. And I wanted to put my deadly scientists in my books. Um, I wanted them to have a key front center role in the book so that when they picked it up, they saw themselves in it and they could, you know, they could see that they were inspiring other children around Australia to love science and STEM. And I think that's really powerful. And, you know, I've spoken about decolonizing the lab coat because a lab coat is just a PPE, bit of PPE. It doesn't matter about your race, gender, um, sex. It, it doesn't matter what it is. It's just a bit of PPE. So um, some bozo on Twitter said to me once, well, if your people were such great scientists, how come they didn't wear lab coats? Well, I made it easier for him with my book, so I put all the mob in lab coats. <laughs> and the the book is uh, illustrated with by Black Douglas, and the illustrations are, are really important, a part of that too. Um, you know, how did you how did you come to make form that collaboration, Corey? Um, Black and I are really good friends. Um, we met at Marcia Langton's book launch a few years ago and and we stayed in contact since we both have a love of nature and animals and and I think that I talk too much and um I think that um black talks too much too so we got along really well and you know there was no one else that I really thought about doing first scientist with other than black because um black and I have like a really good you know really good working relationship and I wanted this book to be um, to show the beauty of our culture and the beauty of our history. Um, and he, I knew that he was going to do that really, really well. So actually we had a few meetings about the illustrations, but most of it was talking about lace monitors and our love of lizards. Um, so we, um, we got along really well. And, and I think that the, the best part about first scientists, the best artwork I love is the forensic scientists part. Um, of first scientists because we don't actually acknowledge forensic science in Aboriginal people, but actually Aboriginal people in our lifetime, Alice, um, were bush trackers and they were finding people missing in the bush and that was forensic science. It wasn't quite aluminol and looking for specks of blood, but it was looking for subtle changes in the land and the hypothesis was to save people's lives and they did. Thanks, Corey. And do you have some plans for any more writing? Um, Anything else in the works I've that you got can talk six- about? I've got six more books coming out with Australian Geographic, which I've almost finished. Um, in terms of a second book, I, I've i got the itch, but I'm just sort of waiting um, a little bit. I've just released um, First Scientist. And as you know, I'm getting married. So I am trying to focus a bit more on, um, you know, getting some of the structures right of Deadly Science, but also um, preparing for my upcoming nuptials. <laughs> Um, no, that sounds great. Mich- Michelle Neal, who's in the chat, is also a forensic scientist. And I hope Michelle doesn't mind me sharing that she's be- she's worn her te- deadly science T-shirt and people um, weren't quite sure whether it was about the forensic science or what it was about. And um, it started some great conversations. I'm sure Michelle can tell us more about that. Um, I also wondered, um, Corey, um, you know, that's a, a great achievement with those books. It's absolutely fantastic. And I know how work, um, how um, hard you work to bring um, Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu into schools and young Dark Emu. Um, are you thinking about any sort of teaching or education resources that, that might accompany your book that could help um, teachers who are perhaps working in schools um, that that um, don't have high populations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or for teachers who who are non-Indigenous to share some of the, you know, the messages of your book? Um, for a matter of fact, so the, the best part about Dark Emu is that it gets people questioning the history that they were taught. Um, so that's why I was sending it out to schools because I think it's a, a really deadly book and I think it's important. And I think those sort of books should be in all schools because they get kids thinking, critically thinking about, you know, what their parents have been taught, what their grandparents have been taught. Um, with my book, First Scientist, we've just finished the teacher's notes. So if there is any teachers out there, reach out. I've got a PDF that I can send you of teacher's notes of how to implement First Scientist in the classroom. Again, this book is um, to encourage kids to dip their toes in. Um, so maybe they'll ask the Aboriginal education officer at their school if they have one or their local lands council or their local Aboriginal group about maybe some of the science that is done on their land. Thanks, Corey. So, I mean, the book is 
it's fantastic and it's also a, a, another way to start new conversations which um i know you're a fan of and and me too i have another question here from bill um and i think bill's question might relate to um aboriginal and torres strait islander people who are living in uh, more remote or regional areas and bill wondered how much of an issue is the need to move out of home and considerable distances from home to study higher education? Um, it's incredible. Um, it, it is a it is a really really hard thing for young people. Um, you know, and and you would know yourself, Alice. Uh, Alice, there's a number of students that I support personally that are moving from Pernalulu in the Kimberley or moving um, to capital cities to study. Um, it can be really tough because a lot of these kids actually go back home. They don't continue their studies. Um, if you can imagine being taken away from your family and what you know um, and being forced to sort of like not forced to study, but having to concentrate when your your parents are 4,000 kilometres away um, or your, your sisters or your siblings and things are happening back home and you can't do anything because you're stuck there. Um, one of the ways we can help is... Um, is provide TARDISes, which is, um, I call it a TARDIS because I'm a Doctor Who fan, but, you know, provide a laptop to the families and the students so they can connect even virtually. Um, you know, student people need to be able to feel supported and they need to be able to feel supported by their own mob and their own people and their family. Now, if you if you take people away from their environment and you, you know, and, and the only options are study or work or out of that community, then what often happens is that sometimes the community get a little bit upset. Other times um, those people might not come back to their community or kids get homesick and they don't study at all. And I think that that's a real, real shame because I think that um, we should be working in ways that people can stay on country and, and continue to study or work. And I think that we're heading there um, thanks to COVID, um, but it, we've got a long way to go. Yeah, thanks, Corey. There's a, a lot of support, a lot of people liking the TARDIS analogy. There's some Hoovians in the chat um, and, you know, trying to trying to, to to link people. You're right that COVID has been obviously, um, uh, you know, it's it's been so dreadful on so many levels. But one of the things that does seem to have emerged from this is that we're better c at connecting uh, virtually and online and increasing a sense of connection in this way. So hopefully... Uh, you know, some of the, the things that we've learned in this time, um, you know, will help us to better connect with people um, who aren't in the same areas as us. And I think, you, you know, providing a computer and access um, is a great way to do that. So thanks for sharing that example. Um, Corey, we, I just wanted to wrap up today. Um, there, there's a lot of support in the chat. I think a lot of people, hopefully they're not already following uh, Deadly Science or Corey Tut on Twitter or on any other social media platform, um, please do do that. And if you're able to think about um, contributing to Deadly Science, either through your time or a donation, um, that would be fantastic. Um, Corey, I just wanted to say thank you very much. Um, it means so much to us that you've been able to speak to us today um, and to give your perspective. And we wish you all the very best with Deadly Science and what comes next. Um, and I would just like to thank you. I know everybody is cheering at home, so I hope you can hear those claps. There's a there's a roar of cheers and a, a loud round of applause. And I'd like to thank um, everyone who's joined us, our platinum sponsor, Atlas of Living Australia, and to let you know that a recording of this session will be available on the platform in around 48 hours time. And now it's time to head back to the timeline and to get ready for the rest of this fantastic afternoon that's scheduled. So thank you so much, Corey. Really appreciate your time. Stay deadly and stay safe, everyone. And I'll see you on the flip side. See you.